Good morning. My name is Howard Burns. I'm the editor of NJ Biz, a division of Bridge Tower Media. I want to welcome all of you to the NJ Biz cybersecurity panel discussion. We have an exceptional panel of experts in the cybersecurity area joining us here today who have selected a variety of informative topics that will be discussed throughout the panel. Please note that at the end of the discussion, we will open up the floor for Q&A with the audience. Moderating our panel discussion this morning is the Deputy Director of Homeland Security for the New Jersey Cyber Security and Communications Integration Cell, Chris Ryan. Mr. Ryan serves as our state's Deputy Chief Information Security Officer. Prior to joining the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security, Chris was the Vice President and Chief Information Officer of a software development company serving law enforcement and judiciary markets called CSI Technology. Preceding his tenure at CSI Technology, Chris was the New Jersey State Police IT Program Manager. Chris has an extensive background including more than 37 years in developing, integrating, and managing software products in addition to leading large, complex information technology product, projects. Chris will be introducing today's distinguished panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chris Ryan. One, one zero, one one zero, one 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 zero, one one, one one. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not the technology talk. Sorry. Uh, good good morning. Uh, thank you for thank you for having me uh, as as the moderator for this panel. Uh, as Howard said, I think it's an extremely uh, well uh, informed, uh, respected, and diverse panel that we have uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to talk to you about not technology only, uh, maybe a little bit about technology, but mostly about the business aspects of uh, cybersecurity, which has really become uh, quite prevalent. It's, uh, it's a topic that I became so interested in, it drew me away from a job that I otherwise loved, and I'm very proud to, uh, to have joined the New Jersey Kick the cybersecurity information cell, that's name is too long. And um, so without further ado, we're going to talk about um, topics we're going to talk about topics that are involved not only uh, business but branding. When you have a data breach and a data loss, we have folks that are going to talk about that, the economic as well as the uh, company branding aspects of it, the legal aspects, what you can do to protect your company against uh, such instances, as well as how companies are audited and uh, basically um, how companies can assure themselves by a, a third party that whether they're compliant to best practices. So without further ado, first guest, and we're just going to kind of do this in a, in a bit of a random order, I'd like to introduce Chris O'Neill. Chris is in the insurance industry, and I think each person, what we're going to do is offer, uh, allow them to take one or two sentences to describe uh, themselves, a bit of a brief bio, and then we'll get right into a question for them. Chris? Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm an independent insurance agent. Uh, I've been in the uh, business for 30 years. I do property and casualty, personal and commercial, and uh, cyber is a uh, big topic now. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Egan. I'm uh, with the law firm of Archer and Greiner. Excuse me a minute. I chair our firm, Cybersecurity Group. I've spent 40 years litigating uh, uh, cases uh, in the tech sector and uh, run our cybersecurity group at this point. Fairly familiar with the legal principles that apply and we'll be talking about that as the day goes on. Good morning, Michael Markulek. Um, I've spent the past 20, 25 years in cybersecurity. Uh, a lot of work in the federal government, uh, large financial services. My firm, Har uh, Harbor Technology Group, specializes in providing services to small and medium businesses. Those businesses that typically can't hire their own chief uh, information security officer, those businesses that typically think that they're uh, they're safe through obscurity. So we'll uh, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that this morning. Hi, I'm Kurt Roloff. I spent uh, roughly a decade in the U.S. defense industry, primarily in support of DARPA. Uh, I actually recently quit my job so I could found co-found my own startup, uh, focusing on the commercialization of advanced cybersecurity technologies and particularly cryptography. I also happen to be sometimes a professor at NGIT, which is always great too. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Anurag Sharma. I'm a principal uh, with 
with them, Smith & Brown. Uh, it's a regional uh, CPA firm. I'm a part of the advisory practice of Vidham. Uh, my focus is uh, cybersecurity advisory services as well as uh, SOC 1, SOC 2 compliance, ISO 27001 compliance. Anything that remotely relates to security and cybersecurity I'm involved with, uh, about 20 years of experience in the industry uh, doing that. Thank you. All right, so Chris, um, uh, before we begin, I've been asked to uh, share. What we're going to do is we're going to go through some uh, questions that have been prepared by folks that have asked questions of NJ Biz, of the moderators, uh, of the, of the uh, panelists, and the sponsors. We're going to go through a couple of those questions, but we definitely want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. They expect a lot of uh, diverse, interesting uh, uh, questions and answers um, for our panel. So uh, Chris, with the focus on, on uh, the insurance industry, Many types of industry that uh, many types of insurance that businesses need to be aware of and need to prepare for. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing these days in the cyber security prevention uh, uh, insurance. Basically, the uh, traditional GL and property policies uh, were not designed to cover uh, cyber liability claims. So basically, what you're seeing now is a monoline, a standalone cyber liability liability policy. And basically, it's two components, first party and third party. First party gives you a laundry list of coverages, and third party is liability in case you get sued. And it's a, again, there's additional coverages on top of that. So, Thank you. If we could uh, now, is there one mic up here? Or is there yeah, several? Uh, Anurag, let's go to the other end of the table. Uh, Anurag, you had said that um, the work that you do, uh, you really work with companies from an auditing, from a compliance, and from a just a, a threat mitigation and risk profile perspective, can you say a little bit of, uh, about these days the small, medium, and biz small and medium businesses that you've been working with? What are they facing, and what are some of the bigger challenges for them? Uh, sure. So, so before I answer that question, uh, a quick show of hands: How many of you have received some sort of a phishing email uh, in the last month or so? Great. Second question. How many of you feel that either you or your organization fell for one of those phishing emails? Great. So we have a quite, quite a few here who don't know that yet. And that is not unusual. We deal with a, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses. And what we have seen is uh, in the last couple of months, I would say three to four months, there has been a sharp rise in uh, phishing attacks, really sophisticated phishing attacks. And there have been not only small but big companies that have fallen for that. And the reason is, uh, if you see over the last couple of years, there has been a big transition towards adoption of cloud-based technology. Uh, Office 365 uh, comes with a lot of bells and whistles, also provides uh, a great opportunity for hackers because now they can be sitting anywhere in the world and might get access to your mailbox if they can get one employee in the organization to click on a link or share their password, and that's all it takes for them to get in because they don't need to come through the door now. They can directly go to Office 365 website and get access to your mailbox. So f more than half of the calls that we receive from our clients are more than half of the findings that we have when we go into a client site and do some sort of a technology audit is related with directly related with phishing or has some aspect of phishing involved in it. So that as far as I'm concerned, is the number one and the number two threat that organizations are facing these days. And uh, it's, it sounds very easy, but it's very difficult and challenging uh, threat to deal with because you, you, there is no technology solution to it. It's a human problem. And whenever it's a human problem, uh, the solution is never easy because you're talking about each and every employee in your organization being able to understand what it involves and take steps to prevent it. So uh, I think that is the top thread that we have seen, and I'm sure some of the panelists here would share the same thought. Th thank you. Thank you, Anurag. So let's go to Michael now. Michael, um, since Anurag talked about perhaps one of the most dangerous aspects of any company and dangerous cyber risks is the human. Um, how about if you kind of talk a little bit about some of the training and some of the um, uh, ahas that come out in, in what you do for sure. technology training. So there was a great article that came out in the Harvard Business Review uh, about, about six, eight months ago um, 
that talked about the return on investment for um, cyber solutions. Um, and ultimately, the, you know, the, 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 the conclusion of the article was that training, training your staff, training your people, um, is, is a tremendous return on investment. We've seen uh, breaches. We saw a breach in a municipality uh, up in North Jersey um, that ultimately cost them tens of thousands of dollars. They lost tax records. They had to recreate those tax records when the ransomware uh, key that they paid for um, didn't decrypt the data. Um, they trusted the criminal. Tough to believe. But ultimately, the breakdown was at the human level, right? Clicking on something. Training is no longer once a year PowerPoint and donuts, right? Training, especially around cybersecurity, is simulated uh, uh, phishing attacks, is monthly reinforcing training, interactive, small videos, uh, things of that nature, and keeping your staff up to date on the threats that, that you face. As I said, you know, municipality in North Jersey gets hit for you know, a couple you know, tens of thousands of dollars. There are cases where uh, larger businesses in the state have been hit with business email compromise, um, and it's cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? They've wire transferred hundreds of thousands of dollars overseas that they're never going to see again, that doesn't typically fall under their standard insurance policy, all because somebody clicked on a bad link, all because somebody had their email password compromised. So I, I can't stress it enough. I think it's one of the best things we can do is, is train our staffs on what's safe. Uh, and and the, coral, you know, the second piece to that is have a good acceptable use policy. Tell your staff what they can and can't have on their PCs. Tell them what they can and can't do with their computer. Kind of the two biggest things that I recommend. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for the next question, I'd like to uh, tap Kurt on the shoulder. But before doing so, I think there's a, there's a good segue here. When we talk about the risks from from the employees. Well, your employees all have to work within your network, um, whether it's remote, whether it's centralized. And, and before, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the, the strongest strategy for protecting your information technology assets was a strong, hard outer shell. The biggest firewalls, the, the, the tightest firewall rules, the, you know, the, um, the, the fewest access points. Um, that has changed a lot. Business has changed it, and technology has changed it. But most importantly, as Michael said, uh, human behavior has changed it. And the vectors that the threat actors are coming after you for uh, are seemingly harmless, seemingly innocent. And that's why uh, good practices uh, will be the number one, usually the number one or the number two ROI that you can spend and invest in in your companies. So Kurt, in that regard, if I may ask, um, uh, you, had, you had talked about both from a technology side and as a new business startup. If you could tell us a little bit about now some of the technologies and some of the um, either network or software-based technologies that are giving companies a little bit of a fighting chance against the bad actors. Sure, I'd be very happy to do so. So one, one thing that um, I do as in my role as a professor at NGIT is I teach a graduate intro to cybersecurity class. And I happen to be very, very, very fortunate to be so close to New York City that I got a lot of people from industry coming in to take my classes. And usually every time, first, first class I always teach is always I ask people, have they heard of, you know, different kinds of threat vectors? And people have heard of things like spyware and botnets and stuff like that. And one thing that always continually surprises me is I ask the students, have you ever heard of an APT, Advanced Persistent Threat? Uh, for those of you that don't know, this is kind of the classic nation state, um, get into a network, you know, observe, or reconnoiter, move, move laterally, exfiltrate information, move around. It it's, it's kind of gets through this, this notion of, uh, and defeats this purpose of a hard outer, outer shell. Because once you get in, then you start having things like IP theft and, and, and things like that. And it gets at this notion of, of you know, as my, my uh, co-panelists have mentioned, the hard outer, hard outer shell is not enough. It really is about defense in depth, as we say in defense industry. The notion of not only just um, having good firewall rules, good password policies, but even segmenting your network. Um, and so one thing that I, I particularly focus on is the issue of advanced cryptography and the issue of even if you have data stored at rest on your network, making sure it's encrypted at all time, making sure that when you share information, it's encrypted at all time. Just one aspect of it, and of course, this is the tool where, you know, my hammer, I look, at, I look for nails everywhere. But, um, and this notion of defense in depth, 
making sure that you, you keep tabs on your employees, that they make sure they're not disgruntled for some reason or another, uh, making sure that as you, um, um, you know, and obviously you were, you were touching on training, which I think is great, and, and training is a continual process, and, and also I would even call it, you know, the need for continual after action analysis, that as you start to see possible behaviors or force alarms or these kinds of things, go through the what-if analysis of what actually happened to, to um, um, diagnose and, and improve, continually try to improve. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, in your role with a, uh, a large New Jersey law firm, no doubt you represent clients of a, of a wide variety of, of trouble situations or, or potential concerns. Um, what can you tell us about, I, I actually have a, a two-part question. What trends do you see in litigation and in cases involving cybersecurity, and do you really see a difference in what a business must do versus should do from a legal uh, perspective and from a uh, culpability perspective? If you could share a little bit of it about Sure. That. Um, well, the law typically is uh, the last thing to react to developments in society and in business, and, and this is what's happening uh, here. <clears throat> where the, the trend in, in the law is going from uh, a bunch of requirements that you report cyber breaches to requirements that you do things affirmatively to prevent data breaches and any kind of unauthorized access to your system. It's also a smart thing because of uh, uh, your own liabilities that you need to protect against. So that's kind of the movement. It's a lot of particulars. The courts are liberalizing circumstances in which people can sue you uh, for just having had a data breach and having had their personal information exfiltrated. So uh, that's really where the trend's going. There's a bunch of regulations. Delaware just passed a new statute that requires you to take affirmative steps, reasonable steps to prevent uh, uh, data breaches. The European Union has something that's coming online in, in May that's a very, very broad uh, regulation that's going to affect anybody who does business in the European Union, even if you're here in the United States. So that's kind of the trend. Now, I think there's a difference practically between what um, I would tell you you must do and, and then what you should do or things you should consider. A lot of it depends upon resources. Some of this stuff's fairly expensive for you to do. And it's a fine line between what I think you must do and what you should do. And there may even be disagreement about these things among uh, professionals that are in the cybersecurity space as well. One thing I tell you, I think that you must do is go to the New Jersey Kick website. There's all sorts of information on there that's available to you. It's understandable for people who aren't, you know, techno geeks or lawyers or people like that that can help you, particularly in the small business space. It's a good introduction to what you have to do. The second thing I tell you that you must do is talk to somebody like Chris. You really need to explore cyber insurance. Um, there's, it's a complicated area. Brokers who do this can really help you a lot, and and there's a a trade-off there because you kind of get a little bit of an audit uh, while you're doing the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the underwriting, right? <laughs> um, after that, training again, I, you know, we can echo that. We don't need to go on about it. That's something that, that you really need to do. And basically, there are a lot of things that you can do that don't cost much. And if you don't do them, there's really no excuse. And if you suffer a data breach and somebody's personal information or, or protected health information gets out of there, you're more likely to be liable. There are regulated industries. If you're in healthcare or lending or, or government contracting, collections, and on and on, you really do need to hire a lawyer who really knows that area to tell you what you need to do. Um, if you think you've been hacked, you have to hire a lawyer who is knowledgeable in, in cyberspace. And then there's a lot of requirements that you, that you uh, comply with the law that requires notice. Basically, I think you need to employ general best, best practices. Uh, you have to minimize the amount of the stuff that you collect, and you have to minimize the amount of stuff that you keep. These are easy things for you to do. You have to encrypt as much as you possibly can. Shred the old information. You can't just put your computer out back, folks. You have to do something to, in essence, make that, that information unreadable. Um, stop using social security numbers uh, as much as you can. Stop keeping social security numbers on your servers. Uh, limit your access. Uh, to a need, on a need-to-know basis, and enforce and adopt smart policies for your employees um, and, and also manage your updates and, and patches. So those are things I think you must do. There are a lot of things that you could do, which you know, we could talk about later if we have more time. Thank you, Bob. 
Um, a few moments ago, Bob said, um, if you, th those of you who think you might have been hacked, um, well, those of you who raised your hands or at least thought, it, thought about it, those are the right answers, but everybody else in the room was probably wrong. If you haven't, if you think you have not been hacked, in about 99% assurance, you, you have been. And this could have been minor, this could have been insignificant in terms of any data exfiltrated or any damage done to your company, but at a minimum, you've been probed. Let me give you an example. So we have some uh, various technologies, talked about defense in depth, many layers of, of defense for cybersecurity. Um, I just picked one day last week. It wasn't a particularly high day. Um, we have sensors that log any events that, uh, that transverse our network. The state of New Jersey, the executive branch, is uh, held together by the Garden State Network. It's a large, very heterogeneous network that serves all 72 state agencies and offices. Um, the, the logs, the outer logs logged 119 million and change, 119 million events throughout the day, and 11 and a half million of them were threat actions. That means somebody was trying to exploit a vulnerability that we had, um, malware within emails, um, dangerous um, URLs that were sent, botnet activity where some of our state actors ha had fallen for a phishing campaign. We were able to catch uh, a 99 point several nines uh, percentage of this traffic, and then we have to deal with the fallout. That's just one. That's just one state entity. Uh, our job at the kick is really trying to improve the state's risk profile. So I just wanted to, you know, um, say if there is information on the table, or we may have left some around, the NJ kick uh, just. Uh, cyber.nj.gov. Google it. Please become a member. It costs nothing. You have to share an extremely little bit of information, basically some emails, so we can get you these threat alerts. Um, anything that comes up hot, we have uh, analysis performed on uh, public information as well as derived information. So I really think you'll have a, uh, get some value from that, and you can take a peek at it, a scan through. If something looks interesting to you, you can dive in. I'd like to continue, please. <clears throat> Um, Michael, you talked uh, earlier, you mentioned the term CSO as a service, and that, you know, every day we hear uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Tell, tell us a little bit about how a company, especially a small or a medium-sized company, that may or may, not have the, may or may not have the expertise, might benefit from a uh, service like this. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it, as we've been discussing, and as I, I think everybody up here has already touched on, this is kind of a risk-based equation. And, and as business owners, as executives, we make risk-based decisions every day. Um, we make them in finance, we make them in operations. We need to apply the same kind of model to our um, IT and security operations. As IT and security become more and more of our business, you know, we need to put a higher priority on it. To that end, and, and you can read the studies, there's, there's a shortage of IT professionals. There's a shortage of cybersecurity professionals. Um, the government's having a hard time hiring them. Uh, uh, large businesses are having a hard time getting expertise in cybersecurity, which puts the small and medium business kind of at the end of the food chain. Um, one of the things that we've seen been successful is kind of the fractional model, right? You know, most small and medium businesses typically, you know, do HR as a service, right? Or do a fractional CFO kind of model. There's models out there now for chief information and chief information security officers as a service, where you can bring in expertise on a, um, on a fractional basis, on a low monthly cost, to help with things like policy writing, compliance, development of training programs, vendor management, right, risk assessments. Those type of things that you should be conducting in order to reduce the risk inside your business, right? As I tell people, you don't need to be the fastest gazelle. Right? But you need to be a lot faster than your, you know, the rest of the folks out there. And, and, it, and if you're doing the right kinds of things inside your business, it doesn't need to be expensive. This is not about you know, the, 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 the $500,000 firewall. Right? This is about doing the right things to mitigate risk in your business and having a professional that you can rely on, just like you do with an outside counsel, just like you do with the CFO for hire, gives you that peace of mind that on the IT and on the IT security front, you're doing the right things. Thank you. Anurag, if I could ask you a, a two-part question. Throughout the panel today, we've used the term best practices a few times, and uh, I think there may have been a reference or two of NIST. 
right? Uh, could you please explain to the, uh, to the audience, first of all, what NIST is, and then as it relates to kind of a segue into, um, I know that much of us, many of us have uh, assets in the cloud. We have services in the cloud, we have data up there. Can you talk a little bit about what companies should be really focusing on as they place their assets in the cloud and depend on it? Uh, sure. So, uh, in 2014, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, uh, under the guidance from uh, the White House, uh, came out with a framework called the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. Uh, it was a pretty unique uh, approach to trying to solve uh, the cybersecurity challenge and the puzzle because we've always had some shape of security frameworks around for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, there was the NIST 853 for the government sector. Uh, we had uh, the ISO 27001, which was more uh, controls related, adopted by big enterprises. But each of these frameworks were addressing specific parts of the puzzle. And I think uh, NIST was the first framework that looked at the whole challenge in totality and identified the five different areas that any organization, any size, doesn't matter, needs to address in order to try and improve their security posture. It's, it's not just about uh, knowing where your crown jewels are, because believe me, that is uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, doesn't matter the size of the organization. When we walk into a client, uh, a customer situation, and we ask them a simple question, do you know what your crown jewels are? What are you trying to protect? More often than not, the answer we get is everything. And trust me, if you're trying to protect everything, you would end up protecting nothing because no one has that breadth of resources to try and protect everything. So that is the first area that NIST focuses on. You need to know where your crown jewels are. How do you want to protect it so that you can divert your key resources towards that, and then use the rest of the resources to try and protect not so critical areas. And then the focus on uh, detection. We, we spoke about uh, how a lot of folks don't know that they have been breached already. Uh, the statistics is it takes about 200 days for an organization to know that they got breached, which means six months even for big organizations, it takes them six months before they realize that they've either lost data or they have been breached. And the reason is not that they don't have the technology in place, that they don't have <coughs> monitoring solutions in place. They may have that, but it is very difficult to detect a breach. I'll give you a simple example. I want to go back to the phishing uh, example because that is very applicable for small and medium-sized organizations, right? If I'm a hacker, and if I want to get information from your organization, my first priority would be to try and get into your mailbox. Do you know why? Because anything that is of importance to your business would have flown through your email system at least once. If I can get access to your CFO's mailbox, let's just take an example, right? And believe me, it's easier to get access to a CFO or a CEO's mailbox sitting from outside than some of the low-level employees because they are not usually good at using strong and complicated passwords, right? Because you are the owner of the company. You can use a not-so-strong password. No one is going to question it. So let's go back. If I can get into your mailbox, and if I can set a rule to forward every email that is coming to you to an outside mail, a Gmail account of mine, you would not even come to know that anything that you received is going out of your organization and I'm getting access to it without me even coming into your system. Your financials would come to you for approval, I'll get a copy of that. Your payroll register might come to you for approval, I'll get a copy of that. You're looking at acquiring a new company, all those details would come to you for your approval, I'll get a copy of that. I don't even need to come inside your network. Sitting outside, I can get access to that, and six months, a year would pass and you would not even come to know that you're losing data, and till you have some controls in place from your IT department, from somebody who's looking at these things, 
do we have forwards set up for all of our employees? Who are the employees that have forwards set up? Look at those on a periodic basis. Ask questions. Why are we forwarding emails outside the network? And things like that. So it's very easy for small and medium-sized businesses to lose data and not even come to know about that. And NIST is a framework which would ask, would force you to ask those difficult questions and see where you stand as far as controls in this area are concerned. Uh, as far as best practices are concerned, I would think even if you're a small or medium-sized company, it's a very scalable model. You can look at NIST cybersecurity framework and there are guidance on how small organizations can adopt that for their size of operations and try and answer and address some of the risks identified there and you would be far better off than what you are today as far as your security posture is concerned. Thank you, thank you very much. That's extremely informative. Um, can, can I get something real quick on NIST? Certainly. So, so who, in, who in the room knows of NIST, the cybersecurity framework? Okay. Who, who knows a gap in accounting? So, so NIST, NIST is becoming the new, kind of the new gap, right? We're, we're hearing from the federal government pushing down to all of its su subcontractors and all of the sub their subcontractors requirements for the NIST framework. If you haven't heard of the NIST framework, you will shortly. Um, it's, it's being adopted. It's, it's a, as, as uh, was just mentioned, it's a very friendly framework. It's very easy to kind of implement. Um, and we think, and you know, we've done some research on this, we think that we're going to see more and more of this and more of it tied to contracts that you sign either with your commercial vendors or with your vendors that are in the government space. Thank you, Michael. And we're definitely going to jump into the Q&A session in just a few seconds. I have a couple more questions that we talked about we wanted to share. Um, Chris, uh, specifically, the, um, you know, your industry is highly uh, focused on the payment card industry and PCI. Could you say a few words about um, maybe what unique aspects of sharing payment card information, maybe the certification uh, process for a business to become PCI compliant? Basically, um, under third party coverage, under liability, uh, the policy will give you coverage for uh, for the payment card. You could, you could have regulatory uh, fines, they'll pick up the fines for you. Um, and that's all under third party. Um, it also will give you media coverage uh, if you slander a competitor. Now, under the general liability policy right now, you have advertising injury coverage, but it excludes any kind of digital media. So basically, if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn and you slander or copyright, that's a liability coverage that you would have under the third party coverage. Uh, under first party coverage, um, we talk about social engineering is a huge thing about being tricked, tricking device or being tricked, wiring money. You have to watch when you buy a cyber liability policy, you'll see fund transfer fund coverage, or fund transfer fraud coverage. And you think, all right, well, I have coverage for being deceived if you wired money. Well, social engineering is the coverage. So make sure when you're looking at a policy that has social engineering, you're not going to get a million dollar limit. Carriers are very stingy on that you might get two three hundred thousand dollars worth of coverage but it's very important because i mean if i was not in the business i see uh, fund transfer fraud i think i have coverage so think of that that's a first party coverage bob talks about a cyber coach or a quarterback he's the person that's going to sit down and he's going to organize your it company to come in and the insurance company's going to pay for all the the computers to be repaired or and figure out where the breach was and stop it they're going to pay for call centers. They're going to pay for monitoring your clients. Your clients have to have uh, monitoring done. So it's going to pay for the monitoring for the, or that. A big part of it, business income coverage, too. Say you're down for two weeks now. You, lose, you just lost $100,000. Business income coverage is included under that policy, which is huge. To put some business income coverage in a fire, you know, is, is huge. So and now it's excluded under a property policy or general liability, but under cyber, you have business income coverage if it's a cyber attack. So there's just some of the things you have extortion, somebody's holding your system uh, hostage, bitcoins, the carrier will pay, actually they'll pay for the, the, the money to get your system back up and running. That's a last resort, obviously they'll try to resolve it, but uh, that's some of the things that they'll do. Um, and then a new thing, dependent business income. This, this is changing every day, insurance carriers are adding more coverage, so now we have dependent business income. 
what is that? It's you know, it's the cloud, third party. If you have all your stuff in a third party vendor, well, you didn't get hacked, they got hacked, but you lost money, the policy will also pay for that. So there's all kind of coverages. Every policy is different. You have to read, make sure your agent goes to the company, and every company has a different exposure. So just some of the things to, uh, to think about. Talk about regulatory, you got HIPAA fines, the policy on third, policy, or third uh, party will pay for that. And then under the payment card industry, there's fines as well, plus you need an attorney to represent you, they'll pay for that too. So there's a, there's a, there's a laundry list of coverage. And, and, and I think more and more you're even seeing, to support your last point is, I know it's true even in the law enforcement agency, uh, law enforcement <coughs> industry, that persons are being held personally liability, not just their organization, my, my, uh, my police station, my prosecutor's office. They're help, being held personally liability for violations of information breaches and especially as they relate to any civil rights violation. So uh, as we wrap up, wrap up, my last question that I, I think we kind of talked about when we were preparing, uh, Kurt brought up some really good ideas uh, and had some good thoughts to share regarding the sharing of information and transparency and perhaps some information obfuscation. You know, we're a community here. We have different industries and, and different, different uh, goals and, and, and size companies. And sometimes you like to share information to see, hey, what's everybody else doing? Or what happened out there? That's pretty easy to do for state governments. We have structured state uh, information sharing agencies among counties, among states. But for the private sector, it becomes challenging. Sometimes there's a he hesitance or a reluctance to share information that, hey, look what happened to us, um, because that information could be used maliciously against you. So in that vein, uh, Kirk, can you say a little bit about uh, the sharing of information and uh, perhaps obfuscation? You know, I'd be very happy to do so. Um, so this is actually where I have to give a lot of credit to uh, NJ Kick for the um, you know, operation that you have is basically an information clearinghouse, and I have signed up for that before, and I recommend everyone in the room sign up for their email alerts as quickly as possible. Um, and, and one thing that I particularly like about NJ Kick, and also this is my experience as a, as a um, recent defense contractor, is that there is a very tight, mostly by regulation, but there is a very tight community associated with uh, information sharing, both uh, forensically and, and um, um, you know, proactively trying to identify what bad actors are, are doing, uh, particularly more nation state, um, it kind of, so it's very easy to take an us versus them attitude. Um, but at the same time, as I've been moving more into uh, commercialization of technologies and, and, and with my startup in particular, there has been real dearth of information of, of what are the real threats that are going out. I mean, we all see these phishing kinds of attacks. You know, phishing attacks are, are very visible in some sense, even though they're, they're sometimes missed, which is why they get in. But I worry much more about, uh, you know, exploits. Uh, particularly, we were talking before about this hardened shell, about um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of users tend to carry, what, what do they have? Everyone has in their pocket, what, a smartphone, right? Most of us do. And um, a lot of us who work in allegedly secure facilities tend to take our cell phones in with us and use personal email on the job in places where they shouldn't. And I, I worry actually quite a bit about people bringing in malware uh, through these kinds of devices. So not necessarily a human in the loop social engineering type attack, but more of a uh, technology exploit driven uh, vulnerability. And how does one share this kind of information? It tends to be fairly sensitive. It tends to be fairly sensitive with respect to um, someone sees these kinds of things being effective in their network and not wanting to share because the uh, C-suite executives might be personally liable for these kinds of things. Uh, it might be that um, if, if there is bad press associated with exploits and, and vulnerabilities inside an organization, that their sh um, stock price would go down. It might actually block the uh, sales and purchase of organizations, which is something I've seen a couple times. Um, I, I don't quite have a good answer for it. Um, you know, in some sense, as a state taxpayer, I would be perfectly happy to pay a little bit, but not too much more tax money to uh, see NJ Kick kind of enlarge this um, um, operation that they have. But um, you know, then again, I'm always a big fan of, of government, at least the right size kind of government too. So that's just me and my soapbox. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. Um, two things, and then we're just going to open up the floor with uh, for for questions and answers, and we hope you have uh, quite a few of them. Um, one is for to do anything that was mentioned up here tonight, uh, th this morning, that is to remediate your networks, to implement better practices, to understand the framework, to harden your network, to do anything that our panelists talked about. The first thing you have to do is to know what you have. It is amazing how 
few companies could actually give you a representation, an accurate representation of what your information, uh, of what your network looks like. This could be, this is, this is blurred by uh, IoT, the inter Internet of Things, IoT devices, by wireless, uh, by, um, by uh, other extensions of your network, which maybe your IT manager or your network engineer may not have practiced. So uh, another step that we really haven't talked about today, but is very important as you try to reduce your, your risk profile is there are, there, are, there are software and hardware devices that are out there um, that you can employ either as a service or, or you know, purchase something in your network that will continually scan and give you an accurate representation of what's out there, a network map, a network mapping, a network inventory tool. That's function, that, uh, and being, a, being an employee of the state of New Jersey, our network has grown over the last 20, 25 years with different, different employees, different uh, regimes, different um, technologists, and different companies supporting us. So it's quite hard to have an accurate um, um, listing, if you will, of our whole network. And one of our de defense in-depth measures that we are doing right now is we're working to instill um, an accurate and real-time network mapping, network inventory. Um, last question. I mean, that was the last comment. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. I think we've got 10 more minutes. Okay, great. So, so we would like to jump into the Q&A. Oh, 10 more minutes before Q&A. Q &A. Okay. Don't to cut short up on the Terrific. No, th thank you very much, Henry. Uh, would anybody like to? Uh, sure. Uh, you mentioned IoT devices, so we haven't touched upon Internet of Things devices, so I thought it might be a good idea to just delve into that. Uh, all of us are aware of IoT devices, right? Uh, Amazon Alexa's of the world, uh, Nest thermostat, and uh, every once in a while, we'll have, uh, I'll have uh, folks come to me and ask me the question, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on IoT devices and security surrounding that? Uh, uh, and it's a very valid question, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a field that's growing. It's only going to grow and become a bigger part of our life. So it's very important for us to uh, look at these technologies and uh, take a, a very pragmatic approach of what you want to adopt and why. Uh, so here's my two cents on that, right? Even if it's a Philips bulb that you're connecting to your home network so that you can turn it on and off from your cell phone, it's a computer. It's connected to the network, and it's pretty much operating like a computer. You paid $15, $20 for that. Now, you spend $200 protecting your laptop with all sorts of uh, software on it, operating system patches, being applied every month so that it stays secure, none of that is happening to that $20 device that you just hooked on to your network. So you need to look at any of these technologies that uh, you want to adopt from that point of view. It's a computer connected to your network. So it would be, it's not getting patched, it's, it's not designed to be secure because that is not what its purpose was when the product was designed. And Hence, there are gaps, there are loopholes, there are things that can be very easily exploited by people, hackers sitting outside your network if you put it inside your network, right? So the best approach to take would be to think, or rather assume, that whatever you have connected is public, that anybody sitting outside can get access to it. And it is quite possible that you can figure out that perfect use case where you may want to use that, and then there are situations where you may want to avoid the usage and give away the convenience, right? So let me give you an example. IP cameras, very commonly used. I use them at my home. I use them f on the exteriors. I have a set of IP cameras that I've connected on the outside of the house so that I can monitor it if I need to remotely. What is the risk? No risk, it's outside of the house. It is public domain information any which way. So if somebody was able to hack into that and watch the feed, he would get what is outside the house. If at all I decide to use a camera in the interior of the house, I would never connect it to the internet. I may connect it to a DVR so that I can record, and if I need to, I can go in and look at the footage for whatever security reasons, but I do not want to have the convenience to be sitting in the office and being able to see what's inside my house 
because anybody else in the world can do that, right? Similarly, so look at every device that you would want to connect, hook onto your network from that point of view. And you would figure out, every person would have a different level of comfort, but you would figure out what would be the best approach for you. So if you have a Alexa, I've gotten Amazon devices and gift, I've passed it on. Uh, I don't have a device at home simply because I'm still not comfortable having a speaker in my room which can, which has the potential of uh, hearing every conversation in the room 24 by 7, right? And that's just where I am today. It might change tomorrow if I get more comfort surrounding uh, how the security is around some of these devices. But the fact is we are not there yet. We are still uh, blinded by the features of it, and no one is talking about the security. Uh, you know, I'll add to that real quick. We're also seeing that inside of your businesses, right? Manufacturing equipment getting connected. Construction equipment, right? You know, you know earth movers are, are now being connected to monitor for maintenance, its location, its performance, you know, number of hours it runs during the day. That, that's being connected to the network today, right? As I said, your manufacturing equipment's being connected. That 3D printer's being connected. Your postal uh, uh, um, unit that, that's printing out postage for you is being connected. And none of it is being protected the same way we're protecting laptops and servers and infrastructure. So certainly something to think of um, as you go back and look at your business. If I can follow up on that. Um, everybody has their own confidential information, trade secrets, and things of that nature that often gets lost in a lot of the cybersecurity discussion because we're always worried about other people's information, other people's protected information, and, and, and we want to protect against that as well. You have to be careful about how you secure your own confidential information, your own trade secrets, and things like Michael's talking about is exposing some of that to being uh, hacked and exfiltrated uh, and used not only by competitors if they get it, but there's also issues around whether you can, how strong your protections are for those trade secrets if you're just cavalier about about the, uh, the, the security, the cybersecurity um, of them. Uh, and a couple of things like uh, Kurt was saying, knowing where your information is and knowing what your network is, uh, we see it in data breaches where we're, we're brought in and, and technologists come in to, to uh, figure out, well, just what has been accessed, what has been exfiltrated, and a lot of the small and medium-sized businesses really don't know what they had where. And so it's important to get out ahead of that, particularly from uh, a risk minimization perspective. And that then, of course, leads me into the next uh, issue, which is it's very, very helpful to develop an incident response plan in advance of any kind of hacking, where you have people like tech, cyber technologists, you have attorneys, maybe PR, your HR group, uh, and ready to go, because the delays that we have in trying to investigate these things and jump on it uh, can be costly. There are studies that show the faster you get to these things, uh, the, the cheaper, or the, I guess the less expense you wind up with, and you need to pull these people together in a, in a very short period of time. It doesn't really take a whole lot uh, on top of whatever you're gonna do from a, an investigation of your own security to develop that kind of plan and have professionals at the ready who already know your network uh, as well as attorneys who already know your business to get moving on, along those lines, as well as your insurance carriers. Right, I think that's an excellent point. Um, you know, one thing that we've been kind of threading through kind of behind the scenes, I think, in this panel is that we've talked explicitly about financial losses and downtime of businesses. It's, it's almost like the, the, real, the real prize that gets lost in a lot of these data breaches is IP theft to competitors, particularly you know, nation-state type breaches to, to foreign competitors often. Um, and a big part of that is, you know, what, what can we do to protect is a big part of effective security versus strong security. We don't want to harden too much. We want to make sure our, our, our you know, our workers, employees, whether they're um, engineers or, or accounting folks or things like that, can be effective so they're not going to poke holes in the network just to get their job done. And as you said before, I think is an excellent point, which it seems to be threaded through a couple panel comments, making sure that you have someone at the ready to go. If you don't have that capability in-house, knowing who, who, who your fireman's going to be to call in for these kinds of things, incident response, and whether it's a technologist or, or, or a legal or financial incident response. 
and, and one of the uh, hidden consequences of data breaches is reputational loss. Word gets out to your customers or to the public, depending upon you know, what your visibility is in general. And again, the faster that you can deal with this, and the more you can portray yourself accurately as a victim of a data breach, rather than the cause of a data breach, the more you're going to be able to minimize that kind of reputational loss, Th as Thank well you, as help yourself on liability. Thank you very much, Bob. And that really was a good point that you brought up a few moments ago about incident response. Planning for when it happens, not if, but planning for when it happens uh, across all sectors of your company is, is essential. We'd like to open up the floor uh, for anybody that has... Roving mic, though. Okay, yes, roving mic. Um, anybody that has any questions, or if you just want to shout it, I can repeat it. Yes? I'm going to give you the classic uh, lawyer response. <laughs> it, it depends. It depends. <laughs> if they had attended any of these great panel discussions, they'll, they'd have known what they're supposed to do in order to secure their system. Now, actually, there is, there is potential liability. There's a whole other privacy type uh, segment of all this dealing with people who are developing uh, high-tech products, software, and, and what their requirements are to protect against uh, you know, and, and notify of certain privacy risks. So it depends upon whether they towed the line. Sir? Uh, good morning. I'm curious. Today, uh, the talks are endpoints as opposed to nodes and keeping them protected. And in the threat landscape, we're finding that uh, hardening your systems, um, using firewalls, using antivirus, anti-malware just isn't enough. And now we're seeing that there's a uh, artificial intelligence landscape that are identifying anomaly <clears throat> and behavior-driven activities. Uh, how do you feel that market um, is it still new uh, in many ways? There's a couple of major players in that space, but I'm curious to understand how uh, you feel that plays in with respect to defense and data and security. Right, so I really can't speak too much to AI in particular. Um, a lot of these kinds of what they call rule-based systems, behavior-based systems, things like that, they, they've been around notionally forever and a day. They just, you know, call different ways depending on what the, where the market moves effectively um, and, and how these various rules are generated. You know, they're, they're effective, you know, at times for what they do. They, you know, they're not effective at times for things that they're not supposed to do. And so it's, um, you know, I think it's, you know, actually about the um, comment about the uh, um, IoT device before, it's often buyer beware that uh, when you get these devices, and I'll, I'll speak more as a technologist um, than as a business person right now, that typically the people that make these embedded devices, and I, I still call IoT embedded devices, excuse me, um, that they're often developed by engineers who are not cybersecurity experts. They're more devel developed for functionality. So for example, putting the latest and greatest smarts on your car, putting the latest and greatest smarts on your television, putting the latest greatest uh, smarts on your printer, putting the latest and greatest smarts on your drone. And they're sold more for functionality than for security. And so example I like to give, and this is you know, typically when I teach my, my class in Intro to Cybersecurity, is I'm sure most of us had probably bought, purchased a car in the past probably five to ten years. How many of you have ever decided or driven your car buying decision based on the cybersecurity of your car? Right? This is something that you, you sit in and drive at 60 or, you know, if, depending on if you're on I-80, probably 80 miles an hour, uh, typically down the road. And a lot of them are Internet connected. They have these OnStar type systems, which uh, have been hacked before. Uh, they have typically Bluetooth ports. They have TPMS type systems, all these kinds of various wireless devices. Um, you know, I don't want to, you know, do the whole chicken little sky is falling kind of act, but, uh, you know, these things are out there and they're, they're often need to be purchased and used with a conscious decision. You know, I was actually, you know, you know, 
poke you just a little bit. You're talking about your Alexa devices. Uh, what kind of smartphone do you have? iPhone. Yeah, so typically you have an on microphone, right? Uh, it does. Yeah. Um, but we'll go to that later also. <laughs> So, um, you know, typically if, if you have an Android device, you can say, okay, Google, and something will, something will happen more often than not. I think the so. last two questions also point out very well um, that more than we know, um, more things, more, more technologies, more industries than we think of commonly are being connected to the Internet. Um, for example, the state of New Jersey has rec fairly recently published the Water Quality Accountability Act. That's one of the projects that RNJ Kick is working with the New Jersey DEP for the ability to isolate those water purveyors, anybody that has more than 50 customers or whatever, um, identify the water purveyors that have in any way their SCADA or their industrial control systems connected to the internet. And you would be surprised when we talk about policy, I think uh, we talk about NIST-based policies and so forth, it starts with a questionnaire and an audit. You would be surprised how many um, long-time, well-informed, uh, knowledgeable employees. So do you have your uh, SCADA connected to the Internet? Oh, no. Oh, okay. So, and then we talk about maybe their website. And then, well, but the website is connected to that. So, so people just don't understand the level of connectivity through the most sometimes unexpected of means. And the state actually has a statute where um, our director uh, has put out a questionnaire. It is NIST-based, and it's going to basically align specific requirements for a cyber incident response plan to be handed in this year for all of our New Jersey water purveyors. Um, you know, we don't want uh, a bad actor turning up the chlorine levels all of a sudden overnight silently. Th those types of things that could, uh, you know, in, in the same way as Kurtz, you know, talked about the fear of something un unexpected happening to your vehicle. So, you know, you just, it just talks about a mindset. I think that Anurag mentioned it too. It's the mindset of thinking that almost everything can be controlled and those things are not designed with robustness or security in mind. Just Is there another real, question? Real yes. 20 seconds on the anomaly detection. Cases like this where we talk about IoT devices, smart grid, um, things like that, uh, anomaly detection works great. you got hundreds of thousands of devices that are doing exactly the same thing. Very easy to find when one is you know, changing behavior. A lot more difficult when you think about things like cell phones and laptops and, and, and traditional networking gear because it's used so differently. None of us use our cell phones exactly the same, but if we all had smart grids on the side of our, you know, smart grid monitors on the side of our house, they're, they're all acting the same. Much easier to use the anomaly detection in AI in that case. Uh, just a tip as it relates to cell phone and usage of cell phone, right? So uh, we took my example. I use an iOS device. I don't turn Siri off, on. My Siri stays off. And it's not because half the time she can't understand what I'm asking her to do, but <laughs> it's for security reasons. That is one. <laughs> Two, uh, I don't know if any of you use iPhones, but there is a privacy setting in iPhone where you can go and turn off where it would stop tracking your geo-tracking you every second. And I have done that. It's very easy to do. If you have not done it, it comes on by default, which means that you can go and it would show you or anybody else who has access to your phone can go in and see in the last one year with timestamp where you were physically at any given point in time. Now, I'm sure they have a cool name for the feature, but uh, I've turned it off. I don't think that's something that I use. And uh, between Android and iOS, I personally prefer to go with uh, uh, an iOS device simply because uh, the environment is far more controlled. You get updates far frequently uh, because the OS and the hardware are, or, are both managed by the same vendor. So they have a bigger control on the environment as compared to an Android device where the hardware might be, say, Samsung or Motorola, and the operating system is Google. And now you have a couple of parties involved in the process. You will always have communication breakdown, and updates would come later than you would like. So uh, lesser of the two evils, I guess. Sir? Oh, OK. okay. Hello. Hello. And since you buy these equipments, these hardware stuff, right? I mean, the owner should be on the hardware. I mean, I do understand that user we have certain publication to keep some passwords and your everything. But on this first thing is like all these routers, you know, they should they should be responsible to keeping us safe. For example, if you buy a lock for the house, you know, unless you keep the lock outside, you know, 
I mean, that's an interesting one, right? Networking originally was designed, and still what we're doing with IoT devices, is around functionality, connectivity, availability, right? Integrity of the data has come later. So what we've done, and, and it's the fault of panelists up here and panelists on every panel that sit around to talk about IT and security, is we're layering security on. We're not building it in, right? The hope is, with some of the, the newer generations of IoT, we start to build security in, and if not, as you're adding security to your business, or, or you're adding equipment to your business, or you're adding something at home, just you need to think about it today, right? It, it, don't take it for granted that that Google is going to secure you, or that you know, you know that AT and T is going to protect your data in the cloud, right? Make sure the service level agreements are there. And make sure that you're you're consciously building it in. Also, to answer your specific question, right? Uh, nine out of ten times. A hacker sitting from outside is not able to get, if, if I'm trying to get into your network and you're using a Cisco device, uh, the reason why I would succeed in getting in is not because of some vulnerability in Cisco that you have not patched, that can be a possibility. Nine out of 10 times, it would be because the administrator did not use a strong password, did not change the default account it came up with. It is the misconfiguration of the device which is the biggest risk, not the device itself. Trust me, they have invested enough where if you can turn and make sure that you configure it to be used in a right manner, you would be better off than 80% of uh, the rest of the peers. And hackers are lazy. They want to go with easy targets unless uh, you know it's a state hacker and the objective is a particular organization and a particular piece of information or an individual. 99% of hackers are lazy. They're trying to go for the easy targets. And the easy targets are people who would buy off-the-shelf devices and would not invest or do not have the knowledge to configure it correctly. And that can get them in right away. So to go back, if you buy a lock, but if you don't lock the door, then of course, that is something that you are responsible for. Most of us have seen the, uh, the, the TV show or the scene where there's four or five people running from a very angry bear. And um, one guy says, oh, you're not the fastest one here. He says, I don't need to be, be the fastest one. I just need to be faster than the slowest one. To your point, you don't, you don't need to be the most secure. It helps. But you just do not want to be one of the easy pickings. And that's where these poor policies can um, lead. So it's a wildly complex problem, right, the security. We've heard different things about how secure it is, both uh, personally and from a business perspective. Can we sum it all up in, in one way, shape, or form? What should organizations do? Let's take the personal side away. To determine how they approach security, what type of technology they bring in-house, how they uh, invest their time and money and resources, and, and protecting their assets, whether it be intellectual property, branding, financial, etc. You know, turning off Siri, it's a personal decision. You're not into the risk associated with it. But what is the general approach to, to uh, how organizations should, should, should secure themselves? So, uh, perhaps some. I, I have some thoughts from it from a kind of from a government perspective, but I'd like to share maybe uh, anybody from the panel. Uh, on a building a information security and a security risk profile from the bottom up? Yeah, I think you hire one of these guys. I think that's really the, <laughs> <laughs> the best way. To, I mean, from a, from a legal perspective, what we, what we do is, I don't think there is a general answer to that from a legal perspective because so much of it is fact-specific, risk-based, resources-based, and what is a reasonable thing to do from a legal perspective may not be uh, the, the same calculus as what you want to do in order to protect you and your organization. But there are uh, you know, teams of, of people, usually uh, some lawyers involved on the outside, hiring people like this to, to do uh, you know, specific assessments of your own circumstances and then coming up with a plan that suits your needs depending upon what kind of information you have, what sort of risk assessment there is. And you know, we've heard the word risk up here I don't know, probably a thousand times in, in an hour and a half, and, and that's really um, uh, what it comes down to. But as far as actually what to do, uh, hire one of these guys, and then, then definitely talk to this guy, because he's going to mitigate your risk. You're going to have to pay a little bit for it, call the premium, but he's going to mitigate your risk. 
as to the technology, I'll defer to these gentlemen. When we talk about investment, I mean, that, that's the key word. So it's technology. There's so much technology. There's so much expertise, you know, uh, some better than others. But if a company, let's say a startup or even a small company that wants to just, you know, protect itself, it's a culture. It's an investment that says, I'm going to consciously invest whatever percentage of my uh, resources, right, of our, of our profits in the, re uh, in the renewal and the enhancement of layered technology. It's not, you know, so much for marketing, so much for the billboards, so much for the advertising, and then the product glitz itself. That's all very important, but you can't, you got to generate revenues with, with it. But you have to consciously, I think, view technology as something that has to be invested in and it has to be renewed. The hackers of five years ago are using entirely different tools than the hackers of today. Correct. And I think uh, NIST cybersecurity framework that we touched upon initially is a very good tool for you to help through that thinking process. Uh, if you were to hire, say, uh, a firm like Vidim or Mike's firm, uh, we would do the same thing. We would go in, uh, do a cyber, a high-level risk assessment for you, cyber risk assessment, looking at that framework. Because each business is different, the business risks are different, your data that you're storing is different, and hence, the technology that you would need to try and address some of those risks would be different. And have some sort of a risk assessment done, and then you can just keep updating it every year because your business would change, it would require some level of tweaking. But from a CEO's point of view, that is the best tool that would give you an insight as to where do you want to invest the 10, 20, 30, 40, 80,000 dollars of security budget that you have instead of relying purely on your technology guy to make that determination. I'm sure that is a big important piece of puzzle, but it should be driven by business risk. It should be driven from that angle rather than technology angle because that is the latest and the greatest product in the market. But if it is not addressing one of your biggest risks, that is a wasted investment. So uh, real quick, I, you know, I, tend to, I tend to think of it, you know, this is a three-legged stool, right? You know, as you think about risk and cyber risk in your business, you've got the network defense side, right? And to be quite honest, I think we spend too much on the network defense side. I think we're all enamored with new, greater, better technology. Um, you've got the control side, right? These are your policies and procedures. This is what NIST, the, the NIST framework covers. What should you be doing? What are best practices? How do you implement best practices? Do you have an acceptable use policy? And the third is risk mitigation. And risk mitigation looks like cyber insurance. It looks like training, right? It looks like a risk management plan where you understand where your critical assets are and, and what it would cost you if you lost those critical assets, right? So network defenses, controls, policies, procedures, and risk mitigation that includes cyber insurance are the three main components of a, of a security strategy. And I'll build off of that also, is, is something that's been kind of behind the scenes a little bit, and we've kind of alluded to on the panel, is the need for continual reassessment, that setting a cybersecurity policy is not a one and done kind of thing. And as, as our, our moderator said, that um, the, the tools that our adversaries are using now are very different from the tools that were used even several years ago. Um, and you look at the life cycle, particularly as small businesses, as they build, you know, buy hardware, network hardware or, or IoT devices or embedded systems, typically they're set up once and then left let to collect dust in some sort of data closet or something like that. Um, new policies come out from NIST. And I, I would like to put forward the thought that assessing of cybersecurity, uh, you know, obviously we have to do our business, can't do it every day, but I would put it forward as, as schedule it. Put it on your calendar, monthly, quarterly, biannually, sometime regularly scheduled to go and reset, uh, reassess the threat vectors, do, do a quick scan of the networks, and uh, go forward to go and change your policy in, an, in a, an effective way going forward. Can I just add, too, with the cyber insurance? Um, well, Mike and I were kidding around earlier before the uh, meeting started about uh, he, he doesn't like to fill out a 10-page application to get a quote. And that's basically, I think that's everybody's problem. They, they don't want to sit down and, and fill it out. And then basically, with the new cyber software, I can give you a quote with three questions. I just need three questions, and I can send a 100-page proposal that, it, that gives you all the details of the coverages in layman's terms. So. It's getting easier. It's definitely getting easier. 
and uh, like I said, three questions and get a quote. Thanks. Well, I, I think the, the assessment is a key thing here. So even in the best case scenario that a company has really good controls and good policies and everything else, it comes down to the ability to monitor. Because because you are safe today, it doesn't mean that you are going to be safe tomorrow. Things change, technology changes, we know that new up upgrades come from the company, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think that's where it comes to what role does the same technology plays into that, the, the, the same tools. And even if the same tools kept gathering tons and tons of information, you mentioned the logs. How many logs do we have? What's the capability to analyze and find out uh, <coughs> threats on those logs? So what what do you see? How, how do you see the same progressing on this and how the same tools can help the companies? So continuous monitoring, right? Especially in a small business, doesn't need to be doesn't need to be a sim, right? You know, you can do a lot of this a lot of this manually, especially when you're small. But you've got to commit to it, right? Uh, if you've employed a, a, a SIM, a security event information management system, right, a SIM, if you've employed one of those, you need to manage it, right? As, as Kurt mentioned earlier, a lot of these things get set, thresholds get set for alarms, current conditions get set, and then never get changed, right? Or, or, or we dial back on that alarm threshold because we don't like getting that many alarms. Right, so again, if, you, if you've implemented a SIM, I think it's, it's continuous monitoring. Where the SIM technology is going is, is around security intelligence, adding threat information to it so it can become a, a, a more robust platform. And I totally agree with you because uh, I'm a part of the auditing firm. Uh, half my time is spent going into a client side doing a technology audit and figuring out if there are uh, areas where they have gaps and uh, recommendations for improvement. And one of the top things that we come across is uh, the IT team, the IT folks would go in, turn the logs on. They have tons of logs. And now they're getting like, I don't know, 50 emails a day just related with data backup. It's humanly impossible for them to even look at half of those. And then there are 100 emails coming from the firewall log. So turning a log on actually might take you a step back now because you have immuned yourself to ignoring the alerts. And that is just human nature. So the biggest part of the puzzle is to figure out actually what you want to get an alert on and try and keep it to a minimal that you can actually respond to and you have a habit of looking at that because if you're only looking for exceptions, then you would have a better chance of catching something and responding to it than if you are inundating yourself with tons and tons of logs which is good for a forensic analysis if something were to happen and come and somebody needs to come in and look at how that happened and what happened, but it might, might not be the best tool for you to respond and detect an event in a real time manner. I began the uh, panel discussion with one and I've been informed that one is the number of questions that we have more time for, so whoever has the oh. mic. Sir. I want to ask, uh, thank you, this has been super important. So, uh, my name is Jose, I do uh, ground travel for corporate travel. Right? So obviously right now the internet of things is ride right? I mean, everyone in here has probably been inside a ride share. My question to you is, part of my shield when I go to corporate clients is I project the safety of our firm as opposed to taking the ride share. Now, the safety as far as uh, you know, background checks, uh, all the physical things. As far as the internet things go, is I'd like to know what the work thought is on the data behind the supply chain. So we all know they have been breached. That's public knowledge. When it comes to the corporate side, how what are your thoughts on allowing your corporate travelers, the people who do your sales, do your acquisitions, do your legal, um, all those things, that's all put up there for everyone to see when a breach does happen. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that and where, uh, where does product shift really fall in corporate travel based on the side of So, so uh, again, again I, and I always go back to it, it's a risk mitigation problem, right? If, if I'm running a, you know, a 50 chain dry cleaner shop and, and you know, it's me and my CFO and you know, we're traveling, I'm probably not concerned with, you know, 
where, where they are. If I'm running a Fortune 500 and I'm traveling to, 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 to places that, that you know, I, I have concern, um, I probably want a higher level of security. Um, I probably want a higher level of, um, you know, making sure that you know that, that 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 information, that travel information, logs from where I'm, you know, where I'm at, are, are not being provided, right? So, a, again, it becomes a risk equation, and with anything, whether you know whether I'm buying an Alexa, you know, an, an Apple phone, you know, I look at service level agreements, right? And what are the service level agreements, and what are the expectations for that, and how does that fit my my general risk profile? Yeah, I, I'd say. You know, I think that's really well put, that a lot of these ride-sharing type services, they're, they're all about cost and convenience, right? So small business people, uh, personal individuals, you know, it's about cost and convenience. They don't necessarily want to pay for a taxi. They don't necessarily want to pay for a black car. Uh, but, you know, you get to a certain level where that security is worthwhile to you, that you want to start paying for those kinds of things and, and dealing with the lack of convenience that, you know, might, might come with some of those things. So, so let me give a different twist to the whole thing. Uh, and I totally understand from a corporate point of view it would make sense. Uh, but And this happened to me. I was traveling to Europe uh, earlier this summer. And I made a conscious decision of using rideshare services in a country where I have never been before as compared to a local taxi services. And this was not because of cost from a security point of view. Because my thought process was, if somebody, uh, and for a lack of better example, let's say Uber, if I'm taking Uber, Uber knows where I am at any given point in time. The driver knows that Uber knows where he is at any given point in time. So the risk of somebody trying to use that situation, knowing that I'm a foreign traveler in a foreign country, and misuse that situation, gets lowered because there are a lot of people who know where I am at any given point in time. And that, to me, is a better situation to be in and more secure situation to be in than take a local cab in, say, Italy, because then it's just him and I who know where we are, and that is a riskier thing to be in. Totally on personal level, not on corporate level. <laughs> well, um, listen, I know we'd like to continue. I know we have some time limitations that uh, the... Uh, uh, our sponsors have uh, set up for. So I just want to thank you for your interactiveness. Thank you for your questions and your attention. Um, one thing to wrap up, and this is a sad note, but it's, it's a wary note. They, the bad actors, we haven't seen their best yet. And, and that's one thing to be conscious of. We have not seen they, we have not seen their bad yet, their, their best yet. Thank you. I want to thank the panel very much for a really eye-opening discussion this morning, um, and thank you all very much. Um, so excerpts from this panel discussion will appear in NJ Biz in the coming weeks, and if you're not already a subscriber, we have a 16-week free offer that you can sign up for on your way out the door. Please. Uh, Please see Anna Aquaviva for that. And uh, this panel will be viewed in its can be viewed in its entirety on our YouTube channel as well. So if you missed anything, you can go back and you can hear it again. Our next panel will be next month, March 20th, Opioids in the Workplace. We hope to see many of you there again. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you.